Thanks. As said, my name is Jan Hollison, and I'm a senior researcher at the National Museum of Denmark. And I'm here to talk about climate change and the preservation of archaeological sites in Greenland. And before I started, I'd just like to say that the work I'm presenting was done together with René Matisse, who's also from the National Museum of Denmark, Bo Elberling from the University of Copenhagen, and Bo Elbrexen from the National Museum of Greenland. So, most of you are probably aware, Greenland is located in the Arctic. It's a quite large area. It's the largest island in the world. It's mainly covered by ice, and it is and has always been sparsely populated. Nevertheless, it's a place filled with evidence from the past. Like almost nowhere else, you find traces of past generations, and you find very well-preserved organic materials. Currently, there are more than 6,000 archaeological sites registered in Greenland, and uh, it's estimated that another thousands of sites are yet to be discovered in the many remote places of the country. In the last five years, we have been working closely together with the National Museum of Greenland in order to get a better understanding of how climate change affects preservation conditions and the archaeological sites. We've been visiting a number of sites in the western part of Greenland, along the coast here. And one of the areas that we've been working in is the Ilulisat Ice Field area. And the Ilulisat Ice Field area is a UNESCO World Heritage Area. And it's a quite nice place to work. You have uh, one of the most productive glaciers in the world, filling up the fjord with these huge icebergs. And within the World Heritage Area, we find two of the most valuable archaeological sites in all of Greenland. It's the Mermut site, just south of the Lunisat, and then the Kayasak at the southern side of the ice fjord. In 2009, we began a research project at the Kayamitten, which looks like this, seen from above. Uh, the red marking shows the area where, it's, where we today find uh, archaeological deposits, in some places up to three meters thick. So, as you can see, the, the archaeological remains is quite visible at a site like Kaya. You don't even have to excavate to see what people have been eating, to see what kind of remains you'll find. Um, and it contains 4,000 years of history from all the main Inuit cultures living in, in Greenland. And the unique thing about the Kaya mitten and some of the other middens in this area is that there's been permafrost ever since the first people lived here. So you'll find huge amounts of organic materials just kept in the permafrost. There was a small excavation in 1982. They only dug out a few square meters, but more than 500,000 artifacts were found. Wood, baleen, a lot of bones. So there's a huge amount of data stored here in, in the permafrost. <coughs> However, as you heard about Alaska, the climate is changing, and it's changing quite rapidly in the Arctic region. Here you see the mean annual ice temperature for Lewis has for the last 20 years. And as you can see, this is a quite dramatic increase. And global climate models predict that the temperature will continue to increase. And this, of course, raises some question, what will happen to the permafrost? What will happen to the mittens? So, we set out to investigate how climate change affects preservation conditions at a kitchen mitten. Uh, in order to do so, and in order to evaluate what will happen to a site like this, we investigated the materials at the site, looked at the state of preservation, investigated the environmental conditions at the site. Everything was combined in, in computer models to do these future predictions. So, in order to understand the environment. We did quite a lot of environmental monitoring at the site, installed a logger station, measuring different kinds of meteorological parameters, measuring soil temperatures, soil moisture content in order to understand how does the climate affect the conditions within these archaeological deposits. We also, because snow is, this is how it looks during the summer, that's how most archaeologists see a place, but Nine months a year to snow. So of course you need to understand how does the snow affect uh, a middle like this. 
So we installed an automatic camera taking a picture every six hours for two years. So we could see, okay, how does it look during the winter? So we got, this is a picture from December. The sun has gone down for a few months and it looks completely different. I actually also went up there during the winter on a winter field trip and saw how it looked and it was completely different from what you see during the summer. And then we did a lot of measurements, won't go into detail, but investigating the physical conditions and the chemical conditions within the different archaeological layers. And then of course we did a lot of sampling. And Anne today talked about ice cores. We did a, did a permafrost core, a mitten core, three meters thick of frozen materials, brought it home to the lab. And of course we also took about different other samples from different profiles in the middle. This is my colleague Jan who's looking at the wooden artifacts, looking at the, the conditions, the preservation conditions. And all of the permafrost materials are in very good conditions. It's almost like new wood, even though it's 4,000 years old. As said, in 1982, there was an excavation at, at this site, and they left some profiles that we could refine. And in the outer edge of these profiles, we know for sure that these artifacts has been exposed to frost for during the last 28 years. So here we could actually investigate what will a warmer or changing climate, how will it affect the different artifacts. So we brought home samples from these outer layers, and what we saw was that just little thaw during the summer for 30 years has actually quite a devastating effect on the wooden samples. So we could actually see that there's been decay going on just just a few months of, of, of thaw every summer has a, has a negative effect. Then we also did some different measurements. We measured uh, the vulnerability of the different archaeological materials, focusing on wood, bone, and also the soil material, looking at how does changes in temperature or soil moisture affects the, the, the decay rate. And here you see the the temperature dependency of the decay of wooden artifacts. So there's an exponential relationship between temperature and decay. So whenever the temperature increases just by one degree, the decay will increase, increase with 10 to 30 percent. So it's really vulnerable to changes in temperature. And the more the temperature changes, the faster it will decay and the faster it will get it'll be lost. All of the data that we collected was then combined into a model. I won't go into detail here, it's quite technical, but that allowed us to investigate what will happen to the site in the future. And here you see the future temperatures within the midden, just as we heard earlier today. Blue is good, it's frozen, red is bad. The other one shows if the current temperatures continue to be like it is today, everything will be good. But if temperatures increase as is predicted by computer models, or climate models, the midden will begin to thaw. It will take a while, but in the end, at the end of this century, it will begin to thaw. And this will have a negative effect on the artifacts. Just to illustrate, this is the situation today. We have a midden consisting of organic, inorganic, inorganic materials and a lot of ice. Not much oxygen is available at the moment. When the midden thaw, initially it will be water saturated, all the ice will melt, but still, as long as it's wet, it's good, no oxygen is available. But then, after a while, it will begin to drain. And then, oxygen penetrates the ground and all the organics will start to decay. We predict that this will happen within the next 60, 70 years. And then in the end, yeah, we have all the stuff that you have everywhere else. <laughs> There's been much talk about awareness. Well, these results, we actually combined the results from Kaya with soil samples from organic soils in the rest of Greenland, did the same investigations and try to focus not only on archaeology but also on what will happen to organic soils in the whole Arctic region and then of course also focus on the increasing release of greenhouse gases. And that actually made the kitchen midden on the front of nature climate change. So that's another way of sorry, increasing the awareness about 
cultural heritage. So that we're pretty proud of, of, of getting here. Then uh, permafrost thaw is, of course, not the only threat. We heard a lot about coastal erosion, and there's a lot of other different threats in, in the Arctic to archaeological sites. So in 2012, we initiated a pilot project in the new region before we were up here. Now we've moved further south to the capital area of Greenland. Um, and there's also something about public engagement here. Because before starting the project, we actually talked to, to the local people about their relationship to cultural heritage sites and how do they experience climate change and also what sites are most important to them and is often combined with where they go hunting today. Uh, so we did these interviews and then we also looked at old excavation reports, tried to find information on the, the coastline 70 years ago or where do we have good photos. Uh, so we tried to, to find the most suitable places to go out again and see what, how the conditions are today. So we chose a range of sites going from the inner fjord, the continental climate in the inner fjords, to the more maritime climate out here at the coast, just to have this climatic contrast as well in, in the different sites. And we were around 10 people consisting of archaeologists, geographers, conservation specialists. And the basic concept was to visit sites for one, two, or three days, quite fast visits traveling by boat, helicopter, or just hiking. And then at the sites, we did just small excavations, taking out samples, looking at the state of preservation, both at, on the artifacts, but also on the sites in general. And then we also installed <coughs> monitoring equipment at some of the sites. Sometimes a basic setup was used, that one on the picture, and sometimes a more sophisticated setup was used. And then you can see here, we also installed model samples of wood and bone so that we can go back in two or three years to see, okay, what had ha happened to a piece of bone under the current conditions. And just to show some of the results, because we heard a lot about coastal erosion today. In Greenland, it's a bit complicated actually, because most sites consist of solid rock. And the inland ice is thinning at the moment, so we have quite a lot of glacial rebound. The land is rising, actually faster than the sea level. <coughs> so currently there is not, in, the, in that specific area, no, we didn't see much evidence of, of, of coastal erosion. Here we have a picture. Archaeologist Jan Milgo was here at Gradalfjorn uh, 60 years ago. Took a picture of a young boy in front of a huge mill. <coughs> And when we went there out, my colleague Peter is trying to be the boy again. Um, and as you can see, we, there is a loss. A few meters has, has, has fallen into the sea. But whether that is coastal erosion or just normal land erosion, it's, it's difficult to see. Uh, but as temperatures increase in Greenland, what we noticed in the Nuuk area was the increase in vegetation. Because this picture was taken by archaeologist Roussel. 70 years ago, almost 70 years ago, in the Ostmanadale, and he described, described it as easily, easily accessible and dominated by grass. 70 years later, it was completely overgrown by willow, and it was not easily accessible. It was one of the worst hikes I ever tried. <laughs> uh, and that is what we see, that Greenland is getting greener. Uh, and of course, and we also saw evidence of how the roots are starting to, to actually destroy the soil stratigraphy and also destroying artifacts. And this is a Norse ruin, ruin, and that is also completely overgrown. And we also saw actually that locals were sailing out into the fjord systems, and whenever there was uh, archaeological deposits, they were starting growing uh, vegetables. Because you have a nu nutrient-rich soil, so you can actually go out there and grow potatoes on top of the archaeology. So that's a whole new story that Arctic farming is taking over as well. And then of course, again, there's the, the, the degradation that you can't see with your own eyes, what goes 
the decay of organic remains in, in the soil. Uh, we took out a lot of samples. And when looking at it, the state of preservation was actually very good. We find wood, we found birds, uh, what do you call it? Wings. Wings, yeah. We put a thousand year old bird wing with feathers and everything. So the uh, preservation conditions are, uh, looked really good. But when we go more into detail in the lab, here you see the results on the reactivity of the organic material. That's the samples I talked about from the permafrost and mitten. These are samples from the new pure area. So even though the state of preservation appears to be good and you can investigate, do experiments, the quality of the organic matter is much less, it's a much less, yeah, less of a quality than, than what you see uh, when you just take a sample out of the permafrost. And of course it's difficult to say that this has something to do with climate change, maybe it's just a slow process that's occurred during the last thousands of years. But at least the quality is less and this could at least be the future for this side when the climate starts to change. Greenland is, we already heard about Alaska, Greenland is not the only place uh, in the polar region where we have these kind of problems. In 2014, we at the National Museum of Denmark hosted the conference, The Future of Polar Heritage, where people from all around working with different places, uh, in different places in the polar region, came and presented their, their case studies. And what we saw was that there's changes going on every place, uh, in, in a lot of places in the, in the polar region. And currently, too little is actually done too late. It's, uh, it's a huge problem, and not much is actually done to save these, these, these sites. So where do we go from here? In Greenland, of course, it's impossible to visit all 6,000 or 10,000 sites and, and investigate, do detailed study of preservation conditions. And you can't even excavate six or 8,000 sites. But what we can do is to form this, and that's the next step, this risk assessment. We now know that it's permafrost stability, it's vegetation, it's land erosion, it's coastal erosion, so we know more or less what the threats are. So now we need to, to, to develop these different models and put them into some sort of GIS and then do this risk assessment. So that's what we aim to do to pinpoint the areas where we can see this is a high risk area. This is where if and in, at the Greenlandic Museum, there's only four archaeologists working. But a lot of people come from the outside wanting to do research in Greenland. And then they can say, you're allowed to come here, you can do an excavation, but we would prefer you do it in a high-risk area, so that you divide off, we, what do you call it? Yeah, put the money in the right direction. Uh, so, so we aim at developing this prioritizing tool for the Greenlandic National Museum so that they at least know where they should use their money first. Yeah, that's it. And thanks to all the foundations that helped us. And if you want more information.